Our guest on today's episode is my business bestie and dear friend, Patrick Kirby from Do Good Better Consulting. This episode qualifies him as the first ever three-peat guest on the Growing Small Towns show, so we'll have to get him a jacket or a pin or something. But we come together on this episode. You're going to hear him launch into it. We recorded it mostly as if it was just going to land on his podcast, which is called the Official Do Good Better Podcast. But of course, there's a ton of information in this overlap kind of crossover, if you will, episode that makes a lot of sense for you guys, the listeners of our show. He talks about it kind of like that's the only place it's going to live. He says, like, where can we find you, Rebecca? We'll do the exact same thing, of course, in our show notes and give you all the links to everything that Patrick is doing, Patrick's team is doing, because there's so much that you can glean from him. But today what we're talking about is really the intersection between small towns and nonprofits. And really, we're talking specifically about the alignment of funding. Like, how do you align your organization with the right kind of funders so that you can get the kinds of partnership dollars that, A, come with more ease, heart, and connection, and then secondly, that have some sustainability behind them instead of just always feeling like you're chasing a one-time gift or a one-time grant. There are so many things in this episode that I know are going to be valuable to you as a cool person trying to do their cool stuff in their small towns. But the biggest takeaway from all of this is that we have to start realizing the impact of all of these small nonprofits in our small towns. I think most of us don't even realize how many organizations are doing the work not necessarily organized as a business, but as a philanthropic or charitable organization. And these are the places that are making our communities great places to live. And so if we can help them get better at fundraising and chasing down, or not chasing down, not chasing, actually, we don't want them to be chasing. We want them to align themselves with great partners. It's going to make an enormous difference in our overall quality of life. So sit back. I'd tell you to relax, but we're way too energetic for that. So just enjoy this episode. And as always, reach out. Like, let us know. Let me know what this felt like to you, if it meant something to you. If you want to talk about what this could look like in your community, we want to talk to you. And as always, you can like and subscribe to our podcast, share it with people. We need each other, guys, more than ever. So just keep doing what you can with what you have right where you're at to do the cool things in your small town that you want to see happen. I see you, friends, and I will be watching and I will answer your questions and I will cheerlead and champion your best ideas because that's just who I am. So enjoy this episode with my good friend, Patrick Kirby from Do Good Better Consulting. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. And of course, we talk with people who are going to help our small and medium-sized nonprofits do good better. I have a problem currently, which is me trying to figure out how to help and serve rural, small nonprofits. There is a general sense that the money typically raised in the rural nonprofit areas is getting moved, or there's a contraction of the amount of individuals who are going to give to rural nonprofits, mostly because, you know, after the things that have happened over the last couple of years, a lot of money is moving from big corporations to urban centers. Well deserved, well needed, yes. However, our small flyover country nonprofits need about as much help as everybody else. And so where do I go to ask certain questions on the rural nonprofit areas? The only person I trust with that answer, which is Rebecca Hundum. Well, hi. Hey. Thanks for being here. We'll get into a lot of this because I think the whole concept of rural providers, rural nonprofits, rural businesses, this flyover country concept is so important to the communities that are doing work that are, you know, sort of desperate to keep people, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, engaged. And then when there is no money, the missions kind of fall by the wayside. I'm glad that we get to have a conversation about this because you're genius in it, but you're also in it every single day. And what I love most about your perspective is that this is not a philosophical sort of, I'm going to read about it in a book sort of thing, but your whole being and your whole nonprofit itself is based on rural small towns. Right. 
So I would like to, well, you should formally introduce yourself because I'll be, I'll do a terrible injustice to the amount of things that you do because well, the list of things that you do are, <laughs> are is longer than right. what they probably should be, number one. Yeah, for, for that's absolutely certain. Mm-hmm. But Growing Small Towns is your nonprofit. What on earth is it? And right. how are you serving the rural community? So Growing Small Towns, I founded this organization and the intention originally so I spent more than a decade and some change in organizational development. And I still do that. I still do that kind of consulting. So you go into companies and like, what does that really mean? Basically, it's just literally I've rewritten and reset this elevator pitch 10 bajillion times, right? But essentially, I want to help companies prioritize their people in a way that actually lets them walk that talk out, right? Because everybody says their people are our biggest asset. Everybody says that very few companies actually do the hard work because it's very hard work. It's messy because people are messy and humans are difficult and yet humans do all the stuff. So I love working with companies that actual desire to dig into those difficult conversations. It's my favorite work. So I've been doing that work for a number of years. I'm back in my hometown. We're actually recording in the little village of Oaks, North Dakota. Is it a village? It's not. It's bigger than a village. Oh We're bigger gosh. than a village. 1798 was our, popula- or our population as of the 2020 census. So that means 1,798, in case that wasn't clear. <clears throat> Just under 1,800 people, right? Small little town. I grew up here and I had been, I was gone for like a decade. I had come back. And frankly, my kids had gotten old enough where I really started thinking more about like, what kind of community do I want to live in? You know, and I was, had lived here for a, a long while, right? right? But when you're in the thick of it with kids, that's like, you're just surviving. Right. So, oh my gosh, sorry. This is such a, it's such an arc, like most things. But essentially I went, okay, how do I take everything that I know about organizations and what makes organizations strong and healthy, full of leaders that are impassioned and engaged and excitable and all that thing, all those things. What about what I know can translate to communities because communities are simply organizations full of people. And if we have engaged and passionate, excitable, enthusiastic people in small towns, what would that look like? So that was my big, my big vision. And I I started with the intention to basically create three pillars of programming. And I still feel really locked in on those three things because you know for me it was okay what would make my town a better place to live so the first are just robust healthy small businesses so not necessarily like how do we get the next big giant manufacturing place but how do we attract really cool people with really cool skills that want to do really cool businesses in my little town Mm -hmm. right make them cool make them niched make them awesome and unique right so that's the focus and what does that mean like I'll help them however I can. And that's what I've been doing is just paying attention. Like who's coming to me? Who's asking me for help? What do they need help with? Where are the gaps? And it turns out, Patrick, there's an awful lot of gaps. The second is a a focus on the promotion and like the nurturing of an appreciation of arts and culture. High art is how rural people still often think about the arts, meaning that this thing to be observed and not to be immersed in, like, we go and we watch stuff happen instead of like actively participating it and and basically weaving art into the fabric of who we are. And I just want more of us to get those opportunities and more of us to think about it that way because it also helps number one, right? Because there's an enormous intersection between the arts and business. I don't think we're there yet, but we're working on it. And then the third is just general people development. Like you're a person, Patrick. If I am. You, you are such a person. And then if you get better at conflict management, let's say, and you're in a town of 1800 people where you show up at work, that conflict management skill benefits you, it benefits your employer, benefits the customers that work with you. Then you're probably on a committee or two, or, you know, maybe you're part of a church. Maybe you're not. You're on stuff. Small town people were on stuff. And so to me, it makes a lot of sense. If we want all of those organizations to get better, we help the people in supporting, volunteering in, leading in those organizations to get better. So that's the growth of small towns that I care about. There's a couple of things. Number one, full disclosure, we've known each other for a decade. We're yeah. Dang near a decade. Yeah. Because we you met in... when we were 12. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We are youthful. <laughs> 
Yep. One of the things you've always been doing is this is this people development. And mm -hmm. uh, so now that you're in a small town, and then two things that really stick out as far as growing small towns, which is your organizations, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the, the entity as a nonprofit, is the gaps in services and the things that you're trying to provide, right? Or trying to recruit or sort of develop in these small towns and the amount of stuff that people are involved in. Yeah. The nonprofit realm are the gap filling organizations filled with people trying to do that good work, boots on the ground, making the community better, 100%. which is where you and I sort of have mentally merged into figuring, okay, how on earth do we have a conversation that sparks creativity and interest and try to, to reduce the amount of burnout of those who are doing the work, filling the gaps, and especially in towns that do not have a built-in support system right. or fiscal support system mm -hmm. that urban centers do. Right. And that's why I find our conversations on a regular basis so intriguing is that we're trying to come up with or discuss and at least bring up or bring to light some of the struggles, some of the, uh, the, the worries, and some of the solutions that I think you and I have come up with Right. Um, and I thought that would be kind of an interesting topic for today is try to really figure out what on earth are these rural, small nonprofits that are, um, are, are really trying to figure out some significant gaps that the government is not doing or the local community is not covering because either they don't have the ability to, or they've not thought of, or they're not creative enough to do. Like that is a thing. And well, you're having a conversation about it like just two seconds ago right? in your building here right. on food scarcity. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can start with this, which is your pulse in the rural nonprofit community, these small nonprofits. What are the struggles currently? What are their worries currently? You know, sort of looking at a, a, an upcoming recession for a significant amount of time. It's looking like what keeps them up at night? I think about this all the time, especially as of late, given the conversations that we've been having. I feel like when it comes to a topic as dire as food scarcity, like we were just talking about, I think the things that keep them up at night is just the enormity of the challenge, the enormity of the problem. And the reason like our local community can't can't or, or won't fill it at this point is because the enormity of the problem itself is hard to articulate. So I think it's just getting their arms around and again something like food scarcity or really any of those basic needs human dignity and pride becomes a major barrier to the beneficiaries of these intended programs mm -hmm. actually accessing it so i think that's what keeps them up i mean i you know again i'm not that's not the core of my nonprofit, but in talking to them it's just and then it also we just keep going there has to be someone out there with money i mean that's so and then we, we then we start looking to the government right and we start looking to foundations we start looking to grants we start looking in all these places and then i think we lose we lose sight of the fact that giving is always personal yes especially with those uh, core service those core basic need organizations i think that's what keeps them up then when we talk about the um the quality of life organizations like our arts councils mm -hmm. and um oh like we have one of our one of our child well child care would be a, a necessity let's just focus on anything related to the arts um oh like another good one here in oaks is um we have a it's called bear creek rough rider association mm -hmm. so they like they have like equestrian stuff and they do rodeo stuff right but they're they're a club they're they're an organization they're a nonprofit. i think what keeps those guys up at night is the fear. I think the fear, the money, the, fear, the money running out is the fear. And I think what they end up doing is they keep, they diminish or minimize the importance of the mission of like the gap that they actually fill. They see themselves as just a nice to have, not a necessary to have. Because I, I'll even tell, I can understand entirely. I just set it upstairs. Like everything I care about and not care about, but everything I'm trying to do in my organization, it can't happen if people aren't fed. So it's really easy, I think, to get into this weird comparison, especially when it comes to fundraising, mm -hmm. where we're like, well, my, you know, what I do isn't, it's not actually as important as that. And I, from my position, thinking about my community, how do we make this community better? I would argue that you need, we all need to quit doing that. Like 
If your mission isn't enough to get you excited about what you're trying to do, and you don't understand the important role that your organization plays in making your community better, then that's where any of us need to start, right? Yeah. We, we diminish we diminish the value of what we're doing because it's not as important, air quotes, as something like food scarcity. So this, this brings up a thing, and I think a lot of people listening who run small nonprofits will relate well to this, which is, that's a people mental block. It is. Right? So your whole experience doing people development is is honing in on that scarcity almost mindset. reference and mindset, it's right? It's a little woo-woo. I know it is. I know, you know, I've talked it, about that, but it's but not. Is it? I mean, because it's, it's what people do. I know. And I think you separated it really well, greatly, which is the nice to have and the needs to have, mm-hmm. right? So the equestrian group that you referenced. The nice to have is, well, it's adorable, but if it goes away, nothing really changes or is bad about our community. That's their mindset, right? Right. It's it's nice. I mean, we really like some money, but, you know, it's not as important as X, Y, and Z. Right. And that, that leads to fundraising in the free will donations or the trading 20s with the butter braid bit and the pizzas, et cetera. That's where your needs, the nice to haves are. Right. And so what everybody does, and again, everybody is they create a form letter and they all look exactly the same. Yep. And I'm not like, just so anybody listening to this, like I'm not disparaging those groups at this point, they don't know differently. Exactly. And so, and furthermore, maybe their form letter gets them exactly the tiny amount of money they're looking for every year. But what they're not doing is they're not growing. Nope. They're not augmenting their core services. They're not thinking differently. They're not being creative about right. what they could do differently. Yep. They're not making their asks personal, which just kind of goes back to this giving is personal thing, right? Mm-hmm. So when I, and again, when I look at it from, it's amazing how this whole conversation just weaves all three pillars of my particular programming yes. together because a small business, I want to help them get better. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're going to work with me, one of the things we're going to talk about is the kinds of things you want to support philanthropically in our community, mm-hmm. because you're going to get every single one of those form letters. And if you don't have a filtering system to figure out what it is that you <laughs> give a crap about, you're going to feel like an asshole, you know, cause you can only, you only have so much money right. every year. You're not, I mean, you're probably not sitting down and thinking, okay, this is about how much money I'd like to budget towards these things. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we doing that? Mm-hmm. And then furthermore, not just saying how much money, but what things, Mm -hmm. because if we would all do that, Patrick, there's enough money to go around. The whole scarcity thing completely goes away because the truth is the equestrian group, like the rodeo group, people's lives would be less if they weren't here for the people that need and love that thing. So that's why like even quality of life organizations, you freaking matter. So quit acting like you don't matter. Quit acting like you can go away and we'll all just be fine. Because the people that love your services and use your services or attend your events or whatever the thing is that you do, they wouldn't be okay without you. And the food scarcity groups, right? So the food banks, the emergency food pantries, those, those are the needs to have, right? And so Mm -hmm. their whole projection is we don't need, we can't do the things we're doing for five bucks. Right. You need that $5,000 check. And they get it because they position themselves as if the kids don't eat, the families are worried about right. this, right. mental health anxiety is affected, blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. go through the motions where the rodeos or the arts councils, they don't say that. And every one of these organizations have such a value. Oh, and I know. They don't say it out loud. So what I love about your organization is, yeah, you're teaching businesses how to navigate giving or you're having them navigate you know, how to engage in this in the community. What I love about partnering up and chatting about this is that you are now forcing the nonprofits to figure out that their form letter that everybody else is doing is not personal. Pick up the phone and call them and make a relationship. And we talk, oh crap, and we've, for the last two, three weeks, it has been nothing but alignment. Yeah. Aligning right. in the community, aligning with the business, aligning with the individuals who are your super fans, your cheerleaders, mm-hmm. and having them go out on your behalf. How important is it in the rural community for that alignment to matter? And what groups are doing it really well? And then again, we kind of use the ones that aren't, but like what who's doing it extraordinarily? Like great. And the, and I love if you're if watching the video, it's the slow head shake of like I don't know who's I don't doing know. it well. And that's the point. Like right. who's doing it well? 
Well, so let, let me tell you. So we're talking specifically about rural places, right? Like rural, small communities. Okay. I've been in a, an audience listening to you speak before. And you one time said, and you've said it a few times, the robots are winning. And I'm always yeah. like, the robots are not freaking winning. And I get all like huffy about it. Well, here, here's why. So in small towns, town of 1800 people, I know the kinds of things that a Facebook or an Amazon algorithm would kill to have. Yes. Like I know, I intimately know these people. I mean, a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing, like we sit, like if you're a nonprofit in a small town, mm -hmm. you sit on a gold mine of information, of yeah. knowledge and it's intimacy. So if, if giving is always personal, well, good on you. You like, you have a personal connection with all these people. Mm -hmm. Here's what we do with that instead, instead of being like, oh my gosh, we're perfectly aligned to follow Patrick's beautiful framework and <laughs> make amazing asks. Instead, we go, I know this, that, or the other thing. We hand select the data to help justify why we think they won't say yep. yes to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the difference we between, decide for them. The difference between the robots is the robots will ask you every time to watch this. Every time want to click they'll here. ask you, yep. Hey, you must like this. Click here. And in small towns in the rural areas, they do the passive. Well, I don't want to offend anybody by making that ask, or I don't want. I don't. Oh, I'm going to feel really bad about this. Or mm, so. What's really super weird about it? And I'm just going to say it. We are totally comfortable with assuming they won't give. Yeah. Because we're afraid of offending them by assuming that they will. Mm -hmm. Yep. It is an epidemic in the world. Now we, so one of the things that I've been saying a lot in talks and, and in conferences is this particular statement. And if you're listening and you're a small nonprofit and you are worried about offending people by asking them for money, it is a, the story that I tell is that a board member told me this once and it was very offensive. And I nearly cried because it was just a <laughs> thing, right? But he told me, how dare you assume they don't want to donate to us? Right. How dare you assume for them that they're not interested in giving? So if you are in this position, if you are a small nonprofit, if you're real, if you know all the intimate details about that person and you know that they're aligned correctly, but you're going to pass on it, how dare you assume they don't like what you're doing? Right. Until you ask them and engage them and say, you know what? I've got my interest elsewhere. Good. Now you know. Now right. you can help others sort of align with that individual person, but how dare you not? And what is it about the rural area that is, is it just the fear of offending people? Is it the way that we've always done it? What is that thing? It's, it's cultural. I think mm. like there's a, like a humility and a modesty yeah. baked into our culture to our detriment though. Yeah. Like, I mean, this isn't, this isn't one of those things like, and I don't say these things to be disparaging. I want to help fix this because yeah. there are such, so I'm just going to give an example. I'm um, just this last weekend. We have a, a chapter of PEO, which is philanthropic educational organization. It's an international charitable organization. And we have had a chapter here in Oaks forever. I've never really understood exactly what they do. I'm digging in a little bit more now. Haven't seen a lot of form letter solicitation from them or whatever, but they did a fundraiser these last two weekends and they built two escape rooms, which was just like the raddest fundraiser. And I, I went kind of crazy about it. Like, it's just so cool to see people do something completely different. And I sat them down, two of the women down, two of the women that actually each created, like their families created one of the rooms or each of the rooms. And listening to them talk about it. Like mm -hmm. all it was, was me asking them a few questions. They lit up about what this organization has done and the impact that they've made. Nothing in a form letter can articulate that. Cause again, it's about people, right? Like I think about growing small towns and I've got, I've got partners on board. And before I had a building, before I had a, like before I had anything, it was me just talking about basically a world building with them. Like, this is the world I want to live in right here in Oaks. Mm -hmm. Do you want to help me create that? And I got partners from that. I mean, there's no way you can articulate what you and I are talking about in a letter. Mm -hmm. So what, what they end up doing, and I've noticed this too, because I've been paying attention now since you and I have been like really talking about this. It's like, I get a letter and I read it. And what they say is, here's your tears. And they're super cheap, by the way. Oh, always. 
I mean, it's just like literally like how many of those do you have to, how many of those do people have to say yes to for you to pay for the cost of mailing these damn form letters out? How like, many people, how many people, how many me. people live here? Right. 1800 people. Right. So at 10 bucks, that's a crap load of letters that you need to have everybody say yes to, to even make a dent in whatever you're trying to fundraise for in the first place. Right. Yeah. So what I've noticed is they're like, here's the levels. And then it's like, here are all the things we do. Mm -hmm. They just, it's just a laundry list of the things they do. Yep. And an organization has a heart and a soul and the, the doing is a manifestation of that. Right. But so we never get that. Like, what are you here for? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Translating like doings, yeah. activities into inspiration right. and hope and optimism and that whole like world building thing. It's just, that's what's missing. It's missing. And, and they, and they know skill. they do it and they know they do it. They do it every single day. They either feed individuals or they're doing, they're executing all the time. They don't talk about it. They don't brag about it. Oh, they certainly heavens, don't celebrate no. anything. Nope. That is an awful thing. Then we talk about that. You know this. Anyone's listened to this podcast before, we talk about it all the time, which is like you have to celebrate. People want to be associated with winning teams. One of the things that you said was really interesting. It was a couple months ago. And you you get form letters all the time, right? I do. I'm assuming because you have a brick and mortar building. That's right. You are now on the chamber list. You bet. People just you know the address. It. You said something interesting. Up until a month ago or a month ago-ish, you had never been personally asked to give anything to give anything outside of a letter that was dropped off in your mailbox you'd never been asked and i've lived here for 14 years i want people to understand it because the <laughs> when you're looking at your mailing list and it's you know it's an end of year or it's like a, you've got an event coming up and you've got your okay, got my mailing list whatever there are people on that list like rebecca who have never been asked for money uh, can you tell the story like when you actually did get asked because yeah. I want to know what happened. Yeah. I think everybody needs to know yeah. what happened. It's really fun, actually. So Please. I got a phone call and it was a young girl that I have with like their close family friends of ours. Yeah. And she's in high school. She's a senior this year. So I pick up her call, right? Because it's Jay of course you it's, do. It's JC. It's like, so I'm gonna talk to her, right? So she I pick up the phone. I'm like, hey JC, what's going on? And she's like, she's like, Becky, I'm in jail. And I went, oh, I said, who put you in jail? You know, like I knew she's like <laughs> not physically in jail, right? I didn't. And by the way, I didn't know this was going on this day either. This is as cold, like as a, out of the blue. It's not because she's a dear friend, yeah. right? But as out of the blue as anything, like interruption in the middle of my day, yeah. right? Like yeah. I was going places, I was doing things, pick up Jay's phone call. I'm like, hey, Jay, see what's going on? I'm in jail. Okay, who put you in jail? And she's like, Dickie County Relay for Life. Now, when it comes to what I've been asked to do, I've been asked to MC events and speak at events. I've spoken at the Relay for Life. Yeah. I've never personally contributed money. I bought a luminary. Like I've done that, sure. right? Because I have somebody I love that I lost to cancer. But that is the extent of my involvement with this organization, Patrick. JC says, so I have a goal that I'm trying to reach mm -hmm. to, to get out of jail. And I said, what's your goal? Okay, so here's like, again, talking about like the things that you've tried to teach people or like, <laughs> I say try, I mean, you've, te you've taught them, but whether or not they believe you or do it is a whole separate thing. <laughs> but you're like, you gotta know what you're raising and you put the number out there yep. and then you ask them to help. So that's what JC did, she, unbeknownst to her, the beautiful little fundraiser that she is. Mm -hmm. She said, I need $500. And I said, oh, okay. I said, so I can just kind of give you any amount. She goes, well, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with. And I'm like, oh, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And she's like, are you serious? She was like totally shocked because I think she's probably getting $25. Sure. Dollars. But so can you imagine the difference even alone? I mean, no matter what, she called me mm -hmm. and I immediately gave them my credit card and gave her a hundred dollars. Right. They raised a boatload of cash that yep. day, by the way, I talked to the lady that organized them. And again, it was students, mm -hmm. which let me just say like our organizations get, do that, get students involved. It's also really cool to get students used to talking on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. She had to pick up the phone and call me. And she sounded just, she sounded great. When I got off the phone, I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I, I like felt really good about it. Mm -hmm. And that isn't even remotely just alignment with the organization. No. Oh my gosh. If you couple personal connection and alignment with the organization, you'll get more than a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. She didn't do anything out of the norm other than 
they used ambassadors to raise money. It was like a little telethon kind yeah. of thing, right? So yeah. I, it's just a, it was a, such an interesting, clear case study of like the personal connection matters. The frustrating thing that I have about rural and small nonprofits is their lack of, like you said, conviction to need to have that also equates with the dollar amount they ask in the first place. Right. So one of the things that is the most frustrating is if there is a very big need and a very big price tag to the need, right? A building, a new firehouse, a new school, a thing, some big thing. Right. Hospitals are Hospital common work. for our rural sure. places. Yep. 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 Or even if it's like in a, let's just say a hundred thousand dollars, right? Right. Which is let's a biggish number. Which is the biggest number in rural areas. Let's just say quarter million. Let's for quarter million because that's yeah. the least oh, excessive. When you, when right? you put it in Ooh. Yeah, you put it in terms of a million. It's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a big deal. So you've got a project that's a quarter of a million dollars. You go to have your local fundraiser and you're like, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invite people in. We're going to have some sort of thing. And then we're going to ask people for money. You know damn well that it costs you a quarter of a million dollars. And your ask is, can you give either A, 10 bucks or a free will donation? Yep. And you have- Or they say- any amount. Will any do. amount will do. Any amount, any amount matters. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know any amount matters. Sure, if you had an unlimited population to draw from, or you didn't really care in the timeline in which you were supposed to build these things. What you do is you cheapen the need out of the gate by mm -hmm. offering at a maximum amount you're offering is this small pittance. I am not saying 20 bucks to a family who doesn't necessarily have 20 yeah. bucks. This is not what it, I'm talking yeah, about. It's not a value, it's not a, not a value, value no. judgment on that at all. It but. is if you have a quarter of a million dollar project and you say whatever you can give is fine, as an example, $12, you are now making it an okay thing to go, okay, well then they only need 12 bucks. They don't need my big gift. They don't need anything else. You are just trying to get as many people to give you 12 bucks as possible rather than to fund the whole damn thing in the first place. Right. And what I love about what your story is, here's the amount. It's 500 bucks, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm going to say. And it's like what you feel comfortable giving. That's a different than as an example, $10 or that example, other people right. have given me five mm -hmm. because you don't mention that. So that you automatically assume if she didn't tell you what your average gift was, you'd be like, oh, that apparently everybody's giving you a hundred bucks. She actually told me later, she goes, most people were giving $25. Exactly. But if she but if mentioned she had 25, said that to like, me, oh, 25 bucks is expected. Then it puts it in my head. Where instead this was just like, oh, I totally want to help. Yeah. Here's a hundred bucks. You're not distinguishing your nonprofit in the way that you should be distinguishing yourself about what you, like, again, as you said at the top of this interview, what's you value, you matter. It doesn't matter if you're an art group or you are a social group or you are a, an equestrian group, you matter. And the people who are participating, it matters. Their community, it matters. And if you don't believe it, you end up in this, well, now nobody gives us money. Now I feel like nobody cares about us because you don't care about yourself. You don't position yourself as mattering because it's you're in your headspace. Yeah. It's like self-esteem. It is. Right. I mean, it's the same thing. So, so if you become apathetic mm -hmm. towards the mission of your organization, yes. then you should expect your donors to follow because they will. As some, this is so. It's a great transition because this is where your expertise, I think, can be leveraged to those who are in their own heads about this. Which is, as somebody who has developed people, as somebody who's been in a business where people are corporate toxic culture that you've walked into, which I know you have. We've talked about it. We're not going to mention names, but there are some places where you walk in, you're like, what in the hell's going on you here? You can feel it. You can feel I it. mean, it's, it's very woo, but yeah, yeah. I walk in, I'm like, oh, I can't breathe. So tight. what kind of steps from your experience can nonprofits do with their leadership team, with their volunteer oh, core as just, and not even like revolutionaries have baby steps in order for them to get their head right, or at least their head a little better when it comes to believing that what they do is a difference maker, especially in these rural towns. I would look for the evidence of how amazing they are. That's where I would start. Like if you, Impact. yeah, like if you aren't feeling awesome about your organization mm -hmm. at your next board meeting or next committee meeting or however you're organized, sit down and say, prep them to say, come to the meeting prepared to talk about one example or person you know from our last year of work 
that raved about their experience, that shared what they, yeah, I mean, think like arts in particular, right? And then I would say, if you have zero stories, then the next thing you focus on is how the hell are you going to collect them? Because clearly you're not collecting them, right. you know, because you're impacting people. And then I would, again, I'll just keep going down the decision tree here. If the answer is, well, we don't really have any stories to collect. We're asking people, but people aren't telling us anything. Then you need to start looking creatively at how you might tweak your programming. Ask all the people that came to all your stuff and said, how could we be better? Yep. What would you like to see? How could we be different? Innovation doesn't have to be like a completely newfangled idea. It could be a literal tweak to what you're doing. But again, if we just keep asking the same 10 people that come around our table, you're not likely to innovate from the inside, right? You gotta have some either outside perspective. Maybe you and your group, you go and you attend other people's events and you pay attention through this lens of what are they doing differently? It's scary. Well, it's scary because you don't want an answer that's negative. Of course not. So, but right. and so you avoid it at all costs. But it's terrible for your nonprofit. It's, it's terrible for your decision making. Terrible for your nonprofit. How do you get over that? Besides just telling people to get over it. Well, I I think it always comes back to <laughs> like, how is that working for you? I mean, you know, so if you're you, so if you're in your head about this, mm -hmm. I yeah, I want to say just get over it. But I also just want to say, well. What's the risk of doing nothing? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's like the question I mm -hmm. constantly want to ask, like in our community is just, so we're so damn afraid, whatever the fear is, if it's fear of feeling like we're actually failing because yeah. other people are killing it and we're not killing it. Sometimes that's a fear, like fear of really falling short, fear of pissing people off, fear of, you know, embarrassing yourself, fear of um, offending somebody when it comes to asking or whatever. But we never stop to say, so we are, we're super great at like worst case scenarioing all those things yes. out, right? Like, oh, if we do this, this will happen. And oh, this will happen. We never ask ourselves what happens if we sit right exactly where we're at. In a year from now, where are we? Mm -hmm. And then further, in a year from now, where's our community? Mm -hmm. I can't help people get over it other than just to challenge them with that line of thinking. Like you're stuck, right? So your choices are either to stay stuck or to try something new and really hold space for a lot of iteration. It's what it has to be. You have to be willing to try something different we if have, what you're doing is not working. We have uh, an adage we use, and again, probably heard on the podcast too, beforehand, if you want money, ask for perspective. If you want perspective, ask for money. Right. And, and asking people what they think about your nonprofit, what they think about your community, what they think they would do in your position. If money wasn't an object, what would you do and what would you help us with? If we had an open forum to suggest what programming we could expand to help our mission, whatever, what would you do? The engagement there might come, you know what I wouldn't do is this, this, this. Great, that's good insight. It's awesome insight. You now know a little bit more about your community, your donor, your supporters, the people who don't support you. You now take all this information, you can make better decisions and you're a better nonprofit, you're a better organization for that. I think what's interesting about this is that in the case of a lot of these nonprofits, mm -hmm. I think that we're talking about specifically in small towns. Yeah. I think if you were to ask people what they think of your nonprofit, they would say, I don't. Yeah. They don't think about you at all. They and don't so even know they don't even know they you don't know, exist. They don't know enough to care. And so that's apathy. Yeah. That's indifference. And that's worse than being hated for what you're doing. Sure it is. Because it's a, like a non-feeling feeling, yeah. right? So if that is in fact what you discover, then you've got to really look at, okay, well, how are we communicating? Mm -hmm. Where are we showing up and how are we showing up? Yeah. How do we communicate with people? If it's through your once a year form letter, you got some work to do. You have a lot of experience in communicating that to small businesses too, right? So right. small business will show up and go, well, hey, this is what we do. And you're like, oh, nobody knows who you do, what you do, yeah. where you're from, what your whole goal is a mission. And one of the things that I really intrigued about is your, your sort of cornerstone, bigger businesses that serve the rural mm. population. Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask that is because it's some of the similar work that you're doing with people stuff, but you're also diving in and you've asked some really interesting questions with the leadership team is not only what your value system is, because right. I think a lot of businesses don't know what their value system is. Right. And once they figure out their value system is all of a sudden you've now turned and you've been asking some of the questions like, okay, so what are you doing with that for the communities that you serve right. in the rural areas? And one of the fun things you're like, you either get a deafening silence of like, um, yeah. give them money 
Right. And that's it. We wait until they come and they tell us they have things they need. Yep. Which is either rare or it's just the form letter pile that you got to comb through. Right. 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 So walk me through kind of because because we you and I have been talking a lot about this. And I think we've got we stumbled across like a super passion between us on what that is for the near future. Right. But what's the reaction for these businesses that serve small rural areas? What's their reaction once they figure out, oh, we've got this wonderful passion project. My guess is they're like, well, how do, what do we do with it? And what's your steps about this? How have you walked through this situation, I guess? So again, we talked about like company culture, right? Which is your values, yeah. the things that you, that drive the way you interact with each other mm-hmm. and the way you interact with the world at large, your stakeholders, right. your customers, whatever. If you don't have that, then you're missing an enormous, you're missing an enormous differentiator, especially from a talent management mm-hmm. standpoint. Right. Okay. So that's kind of the work I do. Yep. Be, like period. That's what I do. Now, again, because we've been talking about nonprofits so much, I I am asked to help and support nonprofits a lot in small towns. Because technically, one of the things that I do is commu- like community development, sure. right? Those are the folks always coming to me and asking mm-hmm. for help. So I started, you know, we started thinking about, okay, well, what's the next level differentiator, mm-hmm. right? In this incredible talent war. Yep. Where and, and furthermore, with millennials coming into the like in droves, like oh, the yeah. boomers are on their way out. Sorry, boomers, you know, but they are you are mm-hmm. you're gonna retire in this. Why did you point at me when you said you I are. didn't? Yeah, yeah. I sorry, I, <laughs> I do that. They're kind of kind of I'm kind of, kind of be scary. <laughs> so this millennial generation and then Gen Gen Z, even the younger yeah. kids, right? Kid, their kids. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, their kids coming into the organizations and. There's this trend Mm -hmm. of social consciousness. This generation, this youngest generation is more socially conscious and more contribution focused than any other generation previous. And now our folks listening to this may be like, oh, you know, I call bullshit, right? Because they're like, they're entitled and they don't care. The truth is they just finally get all of our dismay that life is about more than just working Mm -hmm. and they care about work being meaningful. So the next generation of this recruitment differentiator is being the kind of company that really understands how to beautifully, honestly, and genuinely steward their corporate philanthropy forward in a meaningful way. So when you ask me like, how do I talk about this? That's what we talk about is first of all, If I look at your website and you have like a community tab, which many of them do, right? I will click on that tab. I will read it and I will say, what the hell does that mean? (laughs) Right? Like, (laughs) what does that mean? Like, how, how, how are you? Because again, if you and I know, and I think we all know, if if we really think about it, that giving is personal, Mm -hmm. I believe, and I think you believe too, based on all these conversations that corporate giving can be personal and the best corporate philanthropy is personal. So I want to engage these companies in conversations about that. I think about some of the organizations I've worked with when they are a strong, larger organization. When I say strong, I'm just talking that they have some, they have some financial success. They have sustainability. They've got some strategy. They've got some innovation and creativity and the people that work at that organization, they are positioned differently to help. And again, I'm like such a fan of stewardship, right? Like if you have a gift, I want to help you figure out where and how you can give that of yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, I mean, and again, if our communities can figure out how to help people plug into where they can give the best of themselves, then this place feels like their home. So I want to help companies steward their goodness forward. And we do that by helping them make it personal. Then the best part about that too, is that if you're a nonprofit and you are now watching this happen, you can align yourself so much better with businesses and you don't have to chase for the sake of chasing and ask for these grants that don't have anything to do with what your programming is. And you waste all that time, all the time and effort. And what I love most about this as a game plan is to really shore up how businesses give the way that they feel about it but then you get to have the nonprofits finally feel aligned rather than 
in this beggar mode Ugh, constantly. Right. It's yep. now they have a partner. And they shared not only their resources with their, you know, financial uh, resources, but their leadership resources, right. their talent resources, right. their community resources, where you're now keeping talent because these are individuals who are going to stay in their rural or, or small towns because they believe that what their business is doing matters to the community in which they lived in. So they don't have to go and flee to these big urban centers or to other places mm -hmm. in order to find a satisfactory feeling about where they work. Right. So you as the nonprofit now are a conduit within the not within the for profit realm of making their employees feel engaged. Right. And do you know how much of a win that is for your nonprofit when you feel like you finally figured out that you can go and make a phone call to a, a VP or a CEO of a company of the organization that is funding you because you're refunding them the right. value that they really need to make their culture brilliant. This is like my big wish and dream is that in a community like mine, every single business would be perfectly matched yeah. with a nonprofit or two, yeah. right? And yeah. in the sense that like no form letter and no form letters ever go out again because we don't need them yeah. because we know exactly who our supporters are. We know exactly the organizations that care about the kind of work we're doing. And then there's also this beautiful opportunity for like co-creation of new things and the company gets to lend a part of that. That's, I get, I mean, I get like talk about Pollyanna, like that's, but I think we can make steps to it to start to achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think when there's nonprofits listening here, like, well, that sounds way too big and way too well, right. rash and bold. And I don't know where to start with that. You might not, but it starts with a conversation. It starts with an openness. It starts with a facilitated coffee or whatever with a local business to say, Hey, listen, what do you, what? this is the question. What do you want? Yeah. What do you want out of your giving? What do you want out of your solicitation? It's asking the question mm -hmm. to the businesses rather than just sending them a letter going, I need, I need, I need. The question you and I talked about once was just simply asking the question was when was the last time that you made an investment that made you feel so good that you would do it over and over and over again? Because it's a feeling right? Philanthropy is a feeling. It's the feel good feels. That's why we do it. That's why we do the work. And businesses will be able to answer that. And by businesses, I mean a physical person. Mm -hmm. This is the other mistake I think nonprofits make, frankly, is we talk about businesses as in like a yeah. nameless, faceless business. Right. There are freaking leaders making those decisions. What's yep. the matter with you? Yep. Get back down to the humanity of this all. And the only way you do that is by learning what that person cares about. And you again you could walk around being like well i know i know what they think because i saw them once at a bar i mean like that's like legitimately how we handle this stuff and you could do that you're not doing yourself or your beneficiaries or the people that need you to show up tomorrow you're not doing them any favors no and i think that's the best advice that you can give to a nonprofit is just make sure that you know that this is personal and asking them, that's the best question to ask, which is when's the last time a gift made you feel really, like really so great? Freaking good. Yeah. You just went, you just got out of the office and said, God, I want to do that every single day. And then that's where you start. If you're a small nonprofit, that's the conversation in which you start. And if they say, gosh, I don't know, then it's simply a matter of looking at that person and saying, we can do better. How can don't I help you? Don't you think? Yeah. Like we, we all deserve better. Yeah. Because giving, since giving is personal, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, but you know, when you give to a form letter, you don't actually feel that good about that at all. We have literally made it easy for giving to become apathetic yeah. in small towns. And when it's apathetic, it's an enormous jump from apathetic giving, like, oh, well, whatever, it's the gift, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And really what happens, I think a lot of times is you just, you leave it there. Like, we get them at home, we get them here, I put them on the counter, I kind of look at them, I kind of think about them. There's nothing compelling me other than just like, oh, I haven't missed the deadline. I'm serious. Like it's there's there's nothing in there that's connecting to me as a human or my heart for giving. I have a big old heart for giving. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. Ultimately, if they're gonna give, they have a heart for it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just getting back to the basics. And I, I do think. You know, we've talked about this a bit. I think that COVID just robbed us of a lot of this because we've we're out of practice at just being humans. <laughs> so true. You know, yeah. like we're we're this like weird, stilted, we're still hybrid versions mm -hmm. of our of and the humans are meant to do this. Mm -hmm. We're meant to sit down face to face, 
You're meant to look at each other. You're meant to ask hard questions of each other. And I just think in small towns, we can do this. This is, it's not that big of a lift. I think this would be way harder in a bigger city. Yeah. But for some reason, we we put all this stuff in our heads and we, we're just making it that much harder on ourselves. I think that's the, that's the most brilliant thing ever too, is that when COVID took away our ability to be personal and near each other, the route to start is back to basics. It's yeah. picking up the phone. Right. It's face to face. It is handwritten uh, thank handwritten. you notes. It's all of that. Yeah. And once you get really good at the basics, people are going to remember you because they're you're the ones not trying out the you know the super sexy high tech technology that's going to put a barrier of a computer in front of you again. And don't let the robots win. How about that? That's, don't let them win. Yeah. Knock it off. And there's that's nothing exactly that it. a computer program or a system is going to do better than you passionately talking about why your work matters right. and what those businesses or those communities can do to make that a reality. There's nothing that that can be replicated, that personality stuff. If you're a small nonprofit and you're thinking about that, you're like, that's where I think you can get back on your feet or realign yourself of like, where do I need to get my head right? That. Well, and I've had the art, heard the argument, like, do you really think it's realistic for people to do all of their fundraising face to face? Like that's time consuming and it's this and it's that. And I just keep saying, well, how's your form letter working for you? You know, yeah, of course it takes more time. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of like, where do you start? Start with the people that you already know love what you do. There's gotta be some of them. And if they aren't capable of giving, then you ask them who they know. I can't tell you, like, that's how I built Growing Small Towns. It was just the next connection to the next connection to the next connection. And I met some of the most freaking incredible people in the last year. And it was because of that question. Like, even if they just championed the hell out of the idea and didn't necessarily write me a check, people are more than checks. And so when we walk around acting like, well, we just know it's money, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you need people to care enough about you that they want to write you the check. Like it's, we can't compel people to do that. That's the other thing with companies. Like we've talked about that too, right? We want our companies all want their employees to engage in giving. And so they walk around and they say, Hey, I'd really like it. If you'd give $10 to this charity, it's our charity of the month, right? Yep. Well, they'll do it, but that's compulsion, not commitment. And so I just think there's so much room for this conversation. And I think it'll benefit everybody it'll benefit the nonprofits it'll benefit the businesses and it ultimately benefits our small towns because we have more aligned leaders we have more strategic thinkers and then like those leaders are possibly volunteering or serving on boards for some of these nonprofits mm -hmm. it's like the norman rockwell days of yore patrick just in the sense that you know everybody knows each other and we actually are committed to helping each other grow yep but it all comes down to personal connections all of it does speaking of personal connections if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and they wanted to go and either get your services and or check out what you're doing where on earth do we go to find this they can go to growing small <gasps> yeah that's it that's um, the only place that we well i mean i'm on facebook yeah. i'm on linkedin rebecca and that's where kind of like my, my speaking and consulting stuff lives mm -hmm. but i'm uh, uh, both of those places as always we're going to have our uh links deluge in the, uh, yeah. in the notes and comments. I think this is such a, um, first of all, thank you for the conversation. I think this is one of those, the back to basics, we can be good humans, just make an ask kind of reminders that are not said enough. I know we try to say it as much as possible on this podcast, but if but you need to tell yourself that over and over again. again. And if you're a small nonprofit, even if you're not even in the rural area, if you're a small nonprofit, mm -hmm. if you're a medium-sized nonprofit, you're feeling lost, Get back to the fields. Get back to the the reason why you did this in the first place. Get back to making an ask. Make it personal. Do all the things that we were talking about today that makes you're probably nodding and going, yeah, we need to do that again. Mm -hmm. Well, then do it. Right. And then call Rebecca if you have any questions on that whole thing. And if you're a big business and you're just listening to this, you stumbled across this on iTunes and Spotify and everything else. Right. Well, yeah. Call, us. call her too. You should call us. Yeah. For real. And then it's, we'll talk about it. Right. It's the most excited I've been about an idea yeah. for quite some time, just because like I, there are kind of three places that we look for funding, right? Mm -hmm. We look to the government. Yep. I'm just going to say it. The government will never stand in your corner like a champion because 
The government can't do that. They have to be equitable and they have to be fair and they have to be nonpartisan mm -hmm. and they have to be diplomatic. Even though there's definitely sources of funding available through the government that I mean can make sense, but if that's where you're spending all your time, you're missing the freaking point of giving again, right? Second is large foundations. Foundations do decent work. Oftentimes, though, they have very much their own priorities. Now, if your priorities align with those priorities, beautiful, mm -hmm. good on you. Yep. Chase it down, right? Yep. But again, I think we end up looking at them like they're going to be the savior to us. They're going to come in and they're going to save us. We don't need a savior, but I think corporations and big companies that have an alignment of values with what we want our communities to look like, they can be that hero. And that's why I just think it makes so much sense. We can actually pair. It's like ultimate matchmaking. Yep. I mean, that's what it is. It's yeah. helping them get clear about what it is that they want to be a part of, what they want to see ushered, stewarded forward, and then helping them put their dollars where their mouths are, right? Put your money where your mouth is. If this is what you say you care about, then let's find the organizations that fund that or that do that. This is going to be a fun adventure. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's going to be so fun. We'll make sure to uh, update you on all the fun little conversations because I think that the conversations that we're going to have with businesses and nonprofits while we kind of walk through this. Tons of learning. Oh man. Mm -hmm. We'll be back. It's going to be great. Hey, thanks for uh, joining me. Yeah. Appreciate thanks it. For, thanks for driving down to the big village. The big village. Oaks, North Dakota. We'll see you again here on the official Do Good Better podcast. Thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for watching. Remember, get in the show notes, click on everything growing small towns. And then, by the way, if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, for shame, for get shame. on there and do that. And then immediately go back to the links and then go check out Rebecca's uh, podcast. Check out her speaking. Check out everything she's doing at Growing Small Towns. We'll see you later here on the official Do Good Better podcast. <laughs>